Discover how to innovate your way to your first million in today's episode with West Stringfellow. Welcome to Awakened Titans Podcast with Lily Patrashku. Mind-blowing conversations with influential business titans sharing how you can manifest abundance, love, joy, success through quantum awakening, quantum manifestation, quantum healing, quantum miracles, exponential business growth, and innovative products and services. West Stringfellow is the founder and CEO of HowDo.com, an open source innovation training program and specialized consultancy. Before founding HowDo, West was an innovation executive and entrepreneur with over 20 years of experience. As an entrepreneur, he sold his startup to Target. As an executive, he was VP of innovation at Target, Visa, and chief product officer at Rosetta Stone and led innovation teams at PayPal and Amazon. The first question is, can you tell us how can entrepreneurs innovate their way to their first million? Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, so I think it's a number of steps that they have to take, but the first step is finding a problem that needs to be solved. I think a lot of entrepreneurs have great intentions and great energy, and they want to go out there and build something. They always see a solution that they want to bring to life. And the best way to find the solution that's going to scale is finding a real problem that a lot of customers have, and that in the future, more customers will have than currently have, because that means the market is growing. If there are more problems in the future, that means that market's going to grow. And if you build your business in a market that is growing, then you inherently grow with the market. Thank you. Why does innovation play a crucial role in wealth creation? I think that's a great question. Currently, there are very few ways that money is actually increased in value in a centralized asset. So like wealth creation comes from owning an asset and that asset grows in value. And if you own a house and that house becomes more expensive, then you have more money. Uh, if you own a business and that business grows in value, then you earn more money and you create wealth. And right now, businesses are one of the best ways to make wealth. In fact, for the last 50 years, it's been one of the primary ways that big wealth, like real wealth, has been made. Um, it's not to dismiss houses. That's a very credible way. And some people are fortunate that they have jobs and those jobs pay incredible bonuses. And, you know, that's another way. Uh, investing is another way. But if you look at what people invest in, it's mainly businesses. And uh, so business is the kind of foundational wealth creation vehicle. And the way that businesses grow and the way that businesses get started is innovation. Innovation is simply the process of introducing something new. And so if you're running a business and you want it to grow, you have to do new things. If you're building a business and you want to compete, it has to be a new solution. And so I see innovation as the foundation of wealth creation. Thank you. What inspired your journey of building wealth through innovation? Uh, necessity. <laughs> so I, uh, you know, I needed to, to, to make more money to survive initially and uh, didn't have a great degree. I didn't have, I actually started working full-time before I had a degree. So I had to pay my way through college and doing that, uh, you know, I started at a minimum wage doing construction work and being on trail crew, uh, building trails in the mountains. And then I uh, got injured several times and had to find an office job and was able to get an internship. And at the internship, I uh, had to do this task. I just basically had to run around Denver uh, and find files that were lost for lawyers. And I thought to myself, if I could just fix this problem, like not find all, you know, I was spending two to three hours a day running, literally running around Denver in a suit, sweating in hundred degree weather, just trying to find a file. And it, it, no one could figure out why the files were lost. So I built a little file tracking system on a database, just used a computer, a little scanner. We knew who had the file. They knew who, where they took it. Very simple solution. But I went from being an unpaid intern to being a paid consultant at that moment. And then I realized if I find the problems in the office and fix them, uh, I can actually make more money than if I just sit around in the office and hope to get paid more. And so every job that I went to, I found the biggest problems that I thought I could realistically solve and then tried to solve them. Thank you. What key moment or idea led you to your first million? Uh, joining Amazon was the first uh they i joined when they were very very you know when i joined their stock was at 25 dollars, and now it's like over three thousand eight hundred. uh or i don't actually know where to say but anyway it's very high and then the biggest thing for me was building my own company 
that was when I saw the first real real money and uh, you know I was able to sell it. And that took three years coming up with the idea and then a uh, couple of years building it. And then that was very successful. Thank you. How important is mindset in order to make your first million through innovation? I think mindset's everything. Uh, building a new company is very hard. Innovating is very hard. I don't care if you're in a big company innovating or if you're building your own company uh, with your own resources or venture capital. It's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And if you talk to people who do it and do it for a long time, they'll they'll probably agree with me. Uh, and so, you know, every challenge is either an opportunity or it's an overwhelming challenge. Every day is either a grind or it's, you know, an opportunity to get better and improve and make more progress. And, you know, a lot of times I find that as an entrepreneur, uh, I have to do 70 things in my day. You know, if you have a job, you do that one thing. As an entrepreneur, you do the whole company every day. So that can be really taxing. It can be really fatiguing. And the slow progress that is made when you're doing 70 things every day is real hard to see. But uh, if you have the right mindset, you can see every little bit of progress. Every I say it's a mile wide and an inch forward every day. And the mindset is uh, growth mindset, resilience, uh, focusing on the customer, using data to make decisions. Those are the things that keep you alive. Thank you. I'm the optimization queen. And I find that so exciting every day to kind of implement new things in my company. Now, I wonder what mindset shifts are required in order to be loving the process of innovation as opposed to being um, stumbled by it. Yeah, I think the most foundational one is a growth mindset. And that's just the concept that we can get better with time and that things that we're not great at today, we can be better at tomorrow. And it takes practice. And with practice, we get better. Uh, if you're implementing new processes in your business, like you said, like that, that is new, right? A lot of people find new hard and a growth mindset makes new easier, not easy, but easier. Thank you. What common misconceptions do people have about becoming a millionaire? And how does innovation help dispel those myths? Uh, I think that the number one misconception is that money is happiness and that a millionaire is a destination. <laughs> like, I think that, you know, as an entrepreneur, I didn't care as much about the money at all as I did about having a company that I was building and going to work every day. I love work. And so I took my money and I reinvested it right back in building a company. And that's what makes me happy. Like I'd rather have the opportunity to build something than have a lot of money. Thank you. What are some key strategies for identifying profitable opportunities through innovation? I think there are several. The primary one is, you know, number one, are you in a large and growing market? Number two, can, do you have a, a solution that solves the problem better than the competitor? Uh, and then number three, do other people than the customer find your solution valuable? So, uh, you know, a lot of people focus on the customer and that's great. That's the right thing to do. I say most businesses have two customers. Uh, investors are another customer. Many people miss that as a customer, but investors are the ones who are ultimately going to give you capital to either grow your business, uh, capital if you run into trouble and need to short-term financing like debt, or ultimately they'll buy your business, uh, either on the public market through an IPO or through an acquisition or M&A. And so as much as people focus on the customer, I think it's a, as in the end user or the purchasing customer, I think it's very important to focus on the investor. Thank you. How can someone spot gaps in the market ripe for innovation? There's a process. I've open sourced it on howdo.com for free. I think it's real important that people know how to do that. Uh, I work backwards from the customer and then I look at uh, the growth of the market. And then there's a bunch of steps that people can take to kind of, once you have that foundation of, is the market large and growing? Is there a real customer problem to be solved? Can I solve that customer problem? Once you determine that, and that's just a simple step of questions that you have to answer. And now with LLMs, it's easier than ever to answer. Like ChatGPT, it's easier than ever to answer those questions. But yeah, once you have that foundation of those questions answered, it's a process of then testing your solution and slowly going to market. Uh, and I say slowly, I mean like, you know, uh, slowly on Silicon Valley scale, reduce your risk. Make sure you're not putting all your money into your minimal viable product or your first launch. Uh, you need to actually test your way into market. Thank you. Tell us something about your application of innovation in some of the companies you've worked with and the impact it has created. Yeah. So I think the I'll go way back because, uh, you know, impact and innovation takes a long time to see. And so the biggest impacts that I've had is I launched Amazon's digital video product. So if you've ever watched a video on uh, Amazon, I was on the team that launched the product there. And I helped launch Amazon's first billable web service. So AWS is like a trillion dollar business. I was there for dollar one. And 
you know, those things, when you build something like that, that early stage that becomes so large, we had no idea it was going to be big. Uh, we just focused on the customer. We focused on what do we needed to do that day. And then every day thereafter, those are the biggest impacts that I've had at, at Amazon launching AWS and their digital video. Thank you. Tell us more about other impact you've had in terms of innovation at two other companies. Uh, yeah. So the VP of innovation at Rosetta Stone and PayPal and, and led innovation at um, Target. And uh, I think some of the most fun, I would say, innovation that I was able to do is at Target. They're a huge company, a couple hundred thousand people, 70 billion in sales. And like being able to innovate something that large is just fun. And, you know, at that scale, it's not about me doing really much other than helping people like the several hundred thousand people who work there see what they can do. Uh, and that that's where I had a lot of fun, like helping others learn how they can innovate. And so I built a built an innovation training function and trained thousands of people how to innovate. And then those teams grew the business organically. And then we also built a startup accelerator uh, where we brought in very, very young startups and used Target's expertise and resources to help those startups grow faster. And again, that's fun. I love helping other people grow their businesses. Thank you. I'm an innovation machine, so much so that I could go anywhere and I could find a way to do something a lot better. And I find it actually often a little bit shocking why people hadn't thought of that. But I do wonder, how did you manage to persuade the teams to implement your innovative ideas and also to take those forward? Because I find that's sometimes one of the hardest things to kind of get them on board and also to kind of get them thinking about other possibilities they hadn't thought about. Yeah, uh, I feel like there's two things. One is if I raise the money, it's easy to motivate people. I just pay them a good salary and we all go in the same direction. Uh, if I'm trying to convince people to spend their money differently, I tend to use data and facts and I tend to work backwards from what's important to them. And I work backwards from what's important to their customer and their investor. And in the middle of those interests is an intersection, is a Venn diagram between what the entrepreneur or founder or CEO wants to do, what their investors need and what the customers need. That intersection is the point of opportunity. So ultimately, if I think they need to turn 45 degrees and that intersection of opportunity only points to six degrees, we go six degrees. <laughs> and then we make a little bit of progress and then consistently over time, articulate the change in the business. And you know, articulating change in business is about changing mindsets. It's about changing how people think about things and about how they think about opportunities. So I just take tiny little steps until we get to the destination. Thank you. Innovation often involves risk. How do you balance the risk of failure with the potential reward when trying something new? Customer obsession and data. So customer obsession is really making sure that everything that we're doing is completely aligned with the needs of the customer. We're not doing stuff that's not aligned. And sometimes doing stuff that's aligned for the needs of the customer is unprofitable in the short term, but extremely profitable in the long term. And if you have that customer orientation, it's easy to make decisions that might feel like risks, might feel like investments as opposed to like, you know, a quick return on cash. But those investments are what make durable companies and what make scalable companies and what give you ultimately like real value creation. And then Data is how you determine what the customer wants. And so instrument, literally measure everything that you do with the customer, measure all your communications, uh, measure any interaction the customer has with the business, measure what they do normally. And then in that data is insights. Then those insights help the business move faster from insight to action. And that's how businesses accelerate. They get the information they need to make a decision, they make it rapidly, they make it well, they execute, and then measure what the outcome was for the customer. So we needed to grow sales by 5%. What do we do to the customer? Do we talk to them differently? Do we build a different product? Do we message our product differently? Do we build a new feature? Whatever it is, you know, all those decisions have a impact on the customer. Measure that impact, make sure you're making the right decisions and continually improve. Thank you. Speed to market can dramatically impact innovation, so much so that coming too quickly, you might not, you know, have the right success or coming too slowly to the market could also have this, a similar impact. How can you establish the right moment to come to market to make sure that innovation hits the market at the right time? All right. That's a great question. And honestly, it's one of the hardest questions to answer. Um, I think it's a combination of investor willingness, because big things to investors, uh, customer readiness, meaning they're willing to buy your product and market growth, that the market may not be big, 
but it's growing towards the direction of being big. Those three things uh, can help you find timing. But ultimately, when you think about it, timing is an individual perspective. So the customer who's going to buy your product, it has to be the right time for that specific customer. And it's real hard to place that. But the more data you have, the more you know your customer, uh, the more you are deeply, deeply aligned with the needs of your customer. Like you actually empathize with them. You're not just like, using them as a way to make money. You really care about solving the problem. The more you onboard that customer obsession through data, the easier it is to find the timing. And then the easier it is to manage your spend relative to time. Because like you said, a lot of good ideas might happen early. If it happens early, that just means you need to reduce your spend so you can run longer to get to the where you want to go. Thank you. One important thing for innovation as well is the fact that sometimes multiple companies can come up with a very similar thing and they can try innovating. And what would you say is the key to standing out among companies that have pretty much at a similar time frame, come up with something very, very similar. Another great question. I think brand is generally how customers differentiate between one solution or another. So a great example of that is that Samsung generally has more modern, more feature-rich phones than Apple, and yet Apple gets more press when they launch the same thing Samsung launched a year before. So you know, brand really drives customer preference, and so the more that uh companies spend are building their brand and then reinforcing that brand through every customer interaction through every product the easier it is to differentiate from competitive products that are similar thank you one of the biggest challenges in scaling an innovative idea into a million dollar venture and how do you overcome those obstacles i think the biggest first challenge is are we willing to go through what it takes to make something happen in the market it's years and years of work. It's generally very difficult. And so relative to other experiences, not, and I don't think it's like, you know, as long as you have the right mindset, you get through it. But I think it's just a personal commitment to getting it done. Uh, the other challenge is finding the capital. A lot of times it's very expensive to build new things. And so having the right network, and that takes sometimes years to establish, and then being able to tap into that network and present your idea in a way that's compelling, that incentivizes an investor to invest, or finding the right customer that's willing to buy your product today as it is today, and then being able to grow that customer base. So going from one customer to 10,000 customers, well, profitably, those are the biggest challenges. Thank you. At what point in the journey do you know an innovation is worth scaling? And what steps should one take to turn a small idea into something significant? To turn something small into something significant is uh, kind of this, yeah, I mean, those are very aligned in terms of uh, knowing whether or not something is worth scaling. Again, I just use data, customer obsession, and work backwards from the customer. So the more that I can measure the customer satisfaction with the solution, their willingness to pay, their willingness to stay engaged with the solution, uh, and then any sort of organic uh, growth that comes from a satisfied customer. So let's say I give... Uh, you a solution, you like it, you tell your friends, they buy it too. That's a really good indicator that it's a time to scale, it's time to grow. You talked about it with your friends, they liked it so much, they bought it too. Uh, now, let's say I gave it to you, you used it twice, and then you never used it again. I pay it, spent a ton of marketing and got it to all your friends and they used it once and never used it again. That's not the time to grow. That's not the time to try to scale because the product itself is not solving the customer's problem to the point that they're consistently using it and selling it for you. Ultimately, great products sell themselves. And so the more that you can build a great product, the easier it is to scale, the more efficient it is, the less money you have to spend on marketing, the less money you have to spend building uh, new features to keep the customer engaged. And so it's, it's a lot of iteration with the customer and until you see that the customer is using your product consistently. Once you see that, it's time to scale. Thank you. How can entrepreneurs innovate within their existing businesses to increase profit and move forward towards that first million? Yeah, that's a great question. I think increasing profit is all about reducing costs and reducing costs is about either having better product market fit, meaning that your customer loves your product and they use it and it grows organically, uh, having more efficient marketing, meaning you're able to acquire customers and specifically retain customers that you acquire in a way that is efficient. So like say, if you're spending $10 to acquire a customer and you make $100 on that customer, that's very efficient. If you're spending $100 to acquire a customer and you're only making $10 on that customer, that's a terrible business, right? And so a lot of people tend to kind of get the metrics a little bit messed up. They look at, am I acquiring customers? Are customers paying? They don't look at the cost of owning the customer and the cost of acquiring the customer. 
most. That's a great relationship to keep in mind as you try to think about how to scale towards a million. And then ultimately it's, uh, you know, managing your capital, managing your technology and your team so that you can run the distance. You know, if you have your costs in, you're managing your costs correctly, you're reducing them, uh, you're consistently growing the business and you can run for a long enough time, you're making real money is a time game. Thank you. How can AI or technology be used to innovate? It's great for making ideas. Uh, so if you want to generate new ideas, AI is pretty good. Um, if you want to reduce costs, AI is also pretty good. It's great for copywriting, email writing, marketing, uh, any sort of customer service, any sort of currently high communication format uh, interaction with the customer, like LLMs are great at OpenAI, Claude, those are great at it. If you want to use machine learning, uh, which is also another wonderful tool uh, for, from AI, uh, automating your processes, finding really simple things in the business that have real black and white numbers, and then using machines to reduce the number of humans required for that activity gives you more capital to reinvest in your customer, your growth, your product. Thank you. How can AI be used in order to get faster to the path of the first million? I think it's great for idea generation. I think if you're building a strategy, it's great for trying to think of how these ideas fit in your strategy. I use it as a critic. So I'll upload investor criteria and then I'll upload my pitch or what I'm trying to sell and get the AI to rip it apart. I want that negative feedback from AI before I get in the room with the investor. <laughs> so I find it to be a helpful thought partner. And then as well, you know, again, as we're creating outbound communication, I find AI to be real efficient at making targeted messages to people based on their specific needs and circumstances. Thank you. How do you approach innovation where let's say you innovated on something, but then the market is not aware of their need to actually use it because it's a very demonstrable, such innovative product nobody knows about? Yeah, I think that's a problem with most innovations and it's marketing. You know, it's trying to find a way to get to your customer's head, heart, and wallet, as I say it. Ultimately, they need to think about the product, they need to love the product, and they need to spend money on the product or the innovation, you know. And so the way to do that is marketing, branding, and customer development, like really going and sitting with the customers, understanding who influences them, so who changes their mind. Why do those people change their mind? Is it people on Instagram, people on TikTok, people on YouTube? Is it their friends, their bosses? Like who helps them make decisions? How can you influence those people who help the customer make decisions? And then where do customers go to discover new solutions? So if they're looking for a new solution, do they go to Amazon, Google, Facebook? Where do they go? It's being where they go. Wherever the customer is looking for a new solution, your solution needs to be. And then once they're there is understanding what specifically the customer is looking for. You know, a lot of new ideas have real simple solutions today. So, you know, like the idea of taking a note, I could be competing with an app on the phone or I'd be competing with pen and paper. And so the understanding where the customer is at with their journey towards the innovation is very important as well. So if you're trying to get someone to go from pen and paper to a phone, big leap. If you're trying to get someone to go from one note app to another note app, smaller leap. And, you know, relative to the amount of money you have, you have to figure out which leaps you're gonna ask the customer to take. Thank you. Which tools would you use in order to train your potential customers about the fact that they are the solution to their problems? Social media is a great one. Right now, it's one of the best ones. Um, and then I would use incentives. So I, you know, I think those are some of the highest converting ways to get customers to change behaviors is to actually pay them to change behaviors if you have enough money. Uh, if you don't have enough money, then it's really focusing on solving their most foundational problem. And that means building something that truly, truly meets them where they're at today. And if ultimately the innovation is, you know, if the customer is at point one and the innovation is at point 10 and you need the customer to be at point 10, I work backwards from where I want them to be to where they are. I build a solution for where they are and I build a plan for how my solution will evolve to point 10 so that the customer ultimately gets to where I want them to be. But I start with where the customer is at. Thank you. How do you approach innovation in a crowded competitive market? Back to brand, back to solution differentiation, focusing on the customer, and then ultimately trying to run a more efficient business, especially if it's a crowded market, uh, it's a race to the bottom and price. And so crowds imply efficiency and you know automation therefore rises to the top in terms of how to build the business operationally and technically because automation is the most efficient structure. And so if it's a crowded market, I would be building a very efficient automated business. 
Thank you. If you were starting from scratch today, what's the first innovative move you would make to set yourself on the path to your first million? Build a personal brand. And the most valuable thing that we have is our personal brand right now. And it's very hard to do. It's very time consuming. And there's a lot of people out there trying to do it. But as an entrepreneur, if we're trying to fund our first million, the more credibility we have in the market with our customer, the easier it is going to be to do that. Uh, and so I would say, yeah, just build a personal brand, do this kind of stuff. Thank you. There are people who have no idea how to innovate because that's not their core thing. Their core thing may be to be like a mechanic, to you know um, create great procedures, but they're not so good at innovation. What do you suggest to those specific people that are not creators, they're not innovators, but they are really great at running the business? Yeah, I think uh, just like some folks are great at running a business, some folks are great at innovating. I see that as a consequence of what they learned. I think everyone is capable of innovating and it's just about learning it. And I think what's hard when we get become adults, especially when we're busy and we know what we like to do, we know how to do it. We don't want to think about new things and really we don't want to feel like we're not good at something. And I think it, most everyone can innovate. And that's why I made all the innovation training on how to do free, because I truly believe that everyone's capable of innovating. It's just practice, just practice, 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 just like everything. Thank you. What's the biggest lesson you've learned about wealth building through innovation that you wish you had known sooner? Use other people's money. Like if you have a good idea, other people are willing to invest in you. And, uh, you know, there's a point in time where you have to fund yourself, but most of the time innovation fails. It's really important to remember that. And that it's just such a complicated activity. There's so many things that can influence a success that it's best if, to use other people's money to the extent possible to build and scale your idea. Thank you. How do you stay motivated and inspired on your journey to innovation? I love the problem I'm solving. To me, I think teaching people how to innovate is the biggest opportunity that we have right now. And so I, 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 that motivates me to get out of bed. It makes me excited every day. Thank you. I find that exercise, you know, meditation, getting into a right a state of mind, feeling happy, kind of is, um, is allowing you as a person to become more creative. Do you use any certain routines or habits that enable you to become more innovative? Sleep well, eat well, exercise. It's, it's just the basics. It's crazy how the basics go an incredibly long way. But yeah, it's, it's a lot of people lose. I, I still lose track of exercise because there's so much work to be done. But that's the area that I'm the weakest is uh, not exercising consistently enough. But when I'm the most creative is when I'm well rested, well fed with nutritious food, well hydrated and have had exercise. <laughs> Follow us for more interviews with world's most influential business titans, providing you with the insights to awaken to your full potential so you can get paid to be yourself, find true happiness and manifest anything you desire. 